Howard, thank you so much for those very kind and probably unnecessary words, but very grateful to you. It's a tr truly humbled by what you had to say. It's a huge honour and an immense privilege to have been asked to give this lecture today. And I would like to thank the team at Arthur Rank Centre Germinate for entrusting me with this very precious task. And I hope that I will be able to do justice to the occasion. I very much enjoy opportunities such as this when I can publicly and very openly combine my faith in Jesus Christ as my saviour and the work that I do day in and day out in my day job and in other roles. I do make it a habit to wear my Christianity on my sleeve and seek always to ensure that I don't park my faith in a lay-by whilst I get on with what might be considered secular responsibilities, particularly in my various roles within the farming community. Indeed, the whole premise of having me speak to you today is to focus on leadership beyond the stained glass windows of our churches and to understand how the church can build, nurture, support and equip leaders within the rural, economic, social and domestic environments within which we all operate. In delivering this lecture, I hope to stimulate some fresh thinking. I hope to challenge us all in ways that perhaps might surprise us and to offer some practical considerations that should be in our minds as we think about leadership beyond the church. It is entirely not my intention to be critical of either institutions or individuals, nor to appear to be pejorative in anything that I might say, and therefore I would ask for your forgiveness if I in some way unintentionally fall into any of those traps. In fact, I would commend <coughs> the rural church both for its reach and consistency in being embedded into the whole of rural life. And I have been particularly impressed at the extent to which strong links exist between the church and the farming world. Through organisations such as the Arthur Rank Centre Germinate, the Farming Community Network and REBI, through the church calendar of Plough Sunday, Rogation, Lammas and Harvest, and initiatives like the placing of agricultural chaplains in livestock markets. These are all fantastic touch points which we must covet, protect and grow. It is somewhat daunting, however, to be the first non-ordained person to deliver this lecture. So I thought it might be at least a little bit helpful to give you a small bit of background, other than what uh, Howard has told you, I mean the real background, <laughs> on the person who is giving you this lecture today. So I was born in 1967, yes, I know, I don't look that old, and raised in the southeast city, uh, in the southeast of the city of Belfast. This was the Dunn Estate House in East Belfast uh, up until a few years ago when my mother passed away. I was the middle child of three to a full-time mum and father who through my early years was employed by the retailer Woolworths. Unfortunately, through my mid-teenage years in the early to mid-1980s, he faced unemployment, returning to work in my later teenage years, covering overnight roles in security and in preparing a Tesco superstore for the daily onslaught of shoppers. As you can imagine, we were not considered well off, but we were indeed well loved. As a child, I was probably defined as unremarkable. A bit cheeky, very mischievous, but otherwise a fairly average, if overweight, boy. And this was reflected in my school career, where in class placings of 30 or so in Euston Street Primary School, and there it is, I was always around the 13 to 17 mark in the class. I did reach the heady heights of ninth place in Primary 6, 
my penultimate year at primary school. My teacher in primary three certainly had the measure of me when she wrote on my report, Lately, George's written work has been very careless and messy. Can work well if watched, but lazy. Too true. Not quite the raw material for leadership you might be forgiven to suggest. And my very urban upbringing, at least at first, might perhaps uh, provide a particularly poor basis for my leadership role within an agricultural sphere. However, how many of us in this room have found themselves within a rural setting, having been born and bred in urban environments? One notable course of action I did take, which perhaps laid the foundations for my current lobbying role in the TFA, was at the end of 1975, in primary five, and it was the common practice for the boys to spend Wednesday afternoons doing craft, and the girls were separated off to learn how to knit. Do you remember those days? I had heard on the news that the Sex Discrimination Act 1975 had become law. And so I took it upon myself to tell my teacher that it was now my right to learn knitting. <laughs> rather than being required to do craft. And so I joined the girls as the solitary boy with my blue wool and produced an expanding oblong of knitting stitches and I never made it to learn how to purl before I returned to craft <laughs> with the boys. Fast forward then to my final days in primary seven, the last year of my primary school career, and looking ahead to what school I would go on to for my secondary education. And back in 1978, secondary education in Northern Ireland was selective and was based on the 11 plus <coughs> examination. The, the manner of applying for your future school was done by the class teacher publicly asking each child in the class what their preferred option would be. When my turn came to speak and I articulated my aspiration to attend one of the local grammar schools, the response from my teacher, Mrs. McLean, was to pause noticeably, <laughs> raise her head slowly from the book within which she was recording our preferences, but only to a point where she could look at me over the rim of her spectacles and to utter two words of encouragement. No chance. <laughs> Whilst this is not something that I would recommend should be repeated with any child, I think for me, I needed the challenge. And at that moment, I resolved that I would indeed achieve what I had set out to achieve. And following the 11 plus examinations, I was one of six of my 60 year group who made the grade to attend a grammar school, and in September 1978, I started at Grosvenor High School, and here's my first year rugby team photograph, and I am on the front row, second from the right, looking a bit surly, <laughs> with hair. <laughs> However, I was not the model student, and again faced some fairly accurate but acerbic commentary from my teachers, including my first year history teacher, Mr. Dalzell who, when asking why I was talking in class one day and told that I was asking my neighbour to borrow an ink killer to correct something I had written by mistake, declared, what we really need is a done killer. And in responding to a letter from my mother, who had written on my behalf to apologise for some rather scruffy homework that I produced, the same Mr Dalzell offered the following. Dear Mrs Dunn, Thank you for writing to me. I am not so worried about George's writing as the fact he did not complete homework for me and that the work which he did complete was extremely careless. I agree that he is now making a greater effort, but this is only because I have refused to accept the work he was producing. I have spoken to Peter, my elder brother, who has agreed to keep an eye on George's work. <laughs> and I'm embarrassed to say that matters did not improve much, and as a result, I ended up on what was known as daily report, which required me to ask each of my class teachers to complete an end of lesson assessment on me, which I then had to discuss with my head of year at the beginning of each school day. Then came the 11th of January, 1981. The day that a team led by Saranov Fines completed the longest and fastest crossing of Antarctica. 
But for me, it was an even more important day because at the age of 13, I made a personal commitment to follow Jesus Christ. It was at a meeting on a Sunday night in the Austin Temple, Elam Pentecostal Church on the Ravenhill Road in Belfast, second row back from the front in the middle section, second seat in, under the teaching of the great Scottish pastor, Peter Smith. I cannot tell you anything about what went on in the service, including any of the hymns that were sung, or even anything about the sermon that Pastor Smith delivered. All I can say is that for some reason, on that day, God called me. And I responded to that call by saying, yes. And apart from the relatively unremarkable nature of my childhood and my lack of sound academic performance, two things that would have been noticeable about me to those outside of my immediate family circle were firstly that for one so young, I was capable of using a considerable amount of bad language. And the second, that I was really very nervous about public speaking. I used to hide behind friends in class when English teachers were giving out parts to read from Shakespeare's plays. And I was, if I was ever to be asked to read in an assembly, the words on the page would blur into meaningless hieroglyphics. Upon finding my faith, my friends and others noticed immediately that my speech was considerably less fruity. And gladly, as the Bible tells us, by their fruit you shall know them. An outward sign of an inward transformation. But for me, I also found that God placed a seed of confidence within me that would continue to grow down the years. And I believe that encountering the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the summer of 1982 was also a significant moment in providing me with power from on high, as Luke records Jesus saying in chapter 24. Since those early days, I have sought to entwine my faith with every other aspect of my life. Friends, work, family, and relationships. And I could provide you with many testimonies of how I have seen the hand of God move powerfully in areas of my life. And I do not believe that it's possible for a person of faith to live any other way. In the modern age, there is often a call for people in all walks of life to separate their faith from their work or other life roles. To me, calls for separation or a requirement to leave your faith at the front door of the office are unconscionable. Faith and flesh is what I am. In 2006, Tony Blair famously was caught off guard guard when he was asked if he and George Bush had prayed before the 2003 invasion of Iraq. What was stark about his response was his obvious embarrassment about being asked the question, why be embarrassed in taking such an immense decision and whether it was right or wrong in the end, I for one would have been glad to know that our Prime Minister, as our leader, had consulted God on the matter. Perhaps it was the pressure of the words from Alistair Campbell three years earlier who proclaimed, we don't do God. Perhaps he felt that it was undignified to be seen as a leader needing to appeal to a higher authority. But King David had it right when he was told that he was undignified in the way that he worshipped before the Lord when he said, I'm going to be even more undignified than this in 2 Samuel 6 and 21 and 22. So I stand here to say that I do do God. And that daily, as I enter the office of the Tenant Farmers Association, I pray for God to bless our work, my staff, our members within the farming community, and those we seek to influence who themselves have influence over rural life. As another example, you may recall that during one of our various crises in the dairy sector at the beginning of 2015, the Arthur Rank Centre put out a call for prayer for dairy farmers. Guy Smith of the NFU responded on Twitter by saying, Pray for dairy farmers 
I'd rather all supermarkets just agree to stop devaluing milk by abusing it as a loss leader. My response to Guy through the same medium was, clearly you need some teaching on the power of prayer. He then asked if it was the policy of the Tenant Farmers Association, and I was able to report oops, that it was I was able to report that it was certainly the policy of its chief executive. Which leads me specifically to leadership. And perhaps by this stage you might have thought that I'd forgotten that this was why I was supposed to be addressing you. However, I do believe that what I have said about my position to date is entirely relevant. My background, upbringing, socioeconomic position, early educational achievements would not be the sorts of criteria that you might find on a job description for someone in a leadership position. As I've said, my urban background could also have been a significant stumbling block to leadership within a farming context. However, I believe that it was the seed placed within me on the 11th of January, 1981, and the call of God on my life that has led me to where I am today. I cannot tell you where I might have ended up had I said no to God that evening in the Ulster Temple in Belfast. And to a certain extent, I believe that we have attained entirely the wrong perception of leaders and leadership. When we think of leadership, it's easy to envisage concepts of entitlement, a focus on position rather than role, hierarchy, reward, usually monetary, achievement, control, and a desire to be sought for it to be sought after. The great Scottish theologian Billy Connolly famously said of politicians, the desire to be a politician should bar you for life from ever being one. And perhaps I would venture to suggest the same could be said of leadership. Let's not forget what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 2, that we should do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit and further to have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. My understanding of biblical Leadership is that leadership looks for us, not the other way around. The Apostle Paul again provides us with some further extremely insightful teaching in found for us in 1 Corinthians 3 when he says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready you are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What after all is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. It's interesting that at the start of the book of Judges, following the death of Joshua, without a leader, we see the Israelites fall into all sorts of ungodly ways. And God raises up Othniel to lead the people back to where they should be. After him, the same pattern occurs again, and God raises up Ehud, then Deborah, then Gideon. And then the people have their say, as Abimelech, son of Gideon, raises support for his candidature, and he wins and surrounds himself with a bunch of crooks and and murders all of his brothers by one, before they might undermine his authority. 
Things then go from bad to worse. Interesting then that this is one of three early demonstrations of democracy, which also includes the building of the Tower of Babel and the casting of the golden calf by Aaron. However, I'm not here to address you on my thoughts about democracy. You might have some inkling as to what I might say. We shouldn't be quarrelling over who should lead and who shouldn't lead. Too often, I feel this is something that as a society we do too much, and I think we do too much within the church. The important thing is that we do what we are called to do at the time we are called to do it. In the account of Esther, we remember those important words spoken by her uncle when he said, Who's to say that you have not been called for such a time as this? So too many times I think we quarrel over who's in leadership. Which groups are more represented in leadership than others? Which groups are underrepresented? And how do we ensure that leadership is spread around more evenly? That, to my view, is not the point. And speaking to leaders, we ought not to hold on to leadership too tightly. That is not to say we do not fulfill to the fullest extent possible the role that we have been given as leaders, but we need to know when it is right to stand down or to hand the baton on to someone else. Our leadership should not become our idol. Leadership as described for us through the Bible is very different to the way in which the world sees leadership. Let's look at the fate of the initial leadership team gathered around Jesus History books tell us Matthew was martyred in Ethiopia. Mark was dragged by horses through the streets of Alexandria, Egypt, until he was dead. Luke was hanged in Greece because of his preaching. John survived being boiled in a huge basin of oil during a wave of persecution in Rome and was later sentenced to the mines on the prison islands of Patmos. Peter was crucified upside down on an X-shaped cross. James was thrown off the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem and then was clubbed to death. James, the son of Zebedee, was beheaded in Jerusalem. Bartholomew was whipped to death in Armenia. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece. Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India during one of his missionary trips. Jude was killed with arrows when he refused to deny his faith in Christ. Matthias, the apostle chosen to replace Judas, was stoned and then beheaded. So do we still want the job? (laughs) Leadership in the Old Testament was no bed of roses either. God told Jeremiah never to marry, and he was subject to great hostility, death threats, and being betrayed by his own family. He was beaten and placed in the stocks. When Ezekiel's wife died, he was told not to mourn her passing, and he was required to lie on the ground on one side for 390 days for the sins of Israel, and then on his other side for 40 days for the sins of Judah. Hosea was required to marry a prostitute and to forgive her for her adultery in order to demonstrate how God felt about the apostasy of his people. The Bible provides a narrative around leadership which is hard, costly, messy, sacrificial, lonely, isolating, and sometimes quite bewildering. When all eyes are on you and you don't know what to do, that's leadership. And it throws us completely into the space given to us in Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, which says, To trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Sometimes I think we misinterpret this verse. It doesn't require us to forget what we know and understand. It merely says not to rely on what we know and understand, particularly when times get hard, because God might be doing something differently. We're often told that as Christians, we should be living in victory. And I don't disagree. We absolutely should. However, I was taken by something once said by Mark Greenwood, who heads up the evangelism team for the Elam Pentecostal Church. And he said, if you're hanging on by your fingertips, you are living in victory because you haven't dropped. How often has, as leaders, 
have we felt a bit like that? There's a lovely song that was introduced to me by my daughter from a group called Switch from Life Church in Los Angeles, which has the following chorus, which has been a great encouragement to me. And it says, even in the madness, there is peace. Drowning out the voices all around me, through all of this chaos, you are writing a symphony. So I've said a bit about what I think biblical leadership is. And I would go further to say that my reading of the Bible suggests that it has more to say to leadership beyond the church than it does about leadership within the church. It's entirely wrong to take the view that we can only serve God through the church. It's entirely wrong to consider that a ministry has to have some form of church base. Full-time Christian service does not require a dog collar, a clerical robe, a church title, or even to be known as a missionary. Whether inside the church or outside the church, we are Christians full-time and called to serve where we are. That could be in helping to run young farmers, sitting on the parish council, representing farmers through the various agricultural representative bodies, rural surveying, estate management, livestock auctioneers, machinery dealers, grain merchants, to name but a few. And that is not to say, and don't hear me wrongly, that the church has got no role to play. As leaders in the secular arena, we need to be part of the church, and we need the church to be in our corner. And I will say more about that a little later. However, as leaders in the secular world, we have a job of work to do. The Bible makes it very clear about our responsibilities in this regard. Also, the famous retort of Jesus about paying taxes to Caesar. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Reminds us of that responsibility. And as chief executive of the Tenant Farmers Association, if I spent my day preaching the gospel, studying scripture, and praying for the sick, and that was all that I did, I would very quickly find myself as the ex-chief executive of the Tenant Farmers Association. I have a job of work to do in my role, but I do it fully immersed in who I am in God. In January 2018, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats, Tim Farron, gave an extraordinary interview to Premier Christian Radio. And if you haven't heard it, it's still available online. This was some months after he stood down as leader of the party. He identified as a committed Christian but said that his job as leader of the Liberal Democrats was to get the party's message across. He used the analogy of a chief executive officer of a bus company, spending all the time talking about the gospel rather than sorting out staff rotors and timetables, suggesting quite rightly that they would quickly get the sack. However, the point is, if you are required in any way to compromise on your faith in any environment, be that secular leadership or any other, faith must come first, as it did for Tim Farron. In one of the most moving resignation speeches I have ever witnessed, he said the following as he concluded. I joined our party when I was 16. It's in my blood. I love our history, our people. I thoroughly love my party. Imagine how proud I am to lead this party, and then imagine what would lead me voluntarily to relinquish that honour. In the words of Isaac Watts, it would have to be something so amazing, so divine, it demands my heart, my life, my all. Christians in positions of leadership in the secular world have to navigate eternal thinking within an environment with a time-limited world view. And our churches need to assist our existing and emerging leaders with this task. Our churches need to do this in a number of ways. And it's never easy. And there will have been those around Tim Farron who will not have been able to understand either the pressure that he was under or the decision that he took in the light of his position of responsibility. However, as I said earlier, we must not hold onto our leadership as an idol. We must be prepared to get it, to let it go, as we are, to take it up. So in what we have come to know as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light 
of the world. In understanding to whom these descriptions are applied, we perhaps need to look back at what Jesus said before these remarks. We find in what we now call the Beatitudes some clues. He talks about the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted, the insulted and the accused. Again, perhaps not a list of attributes that would immediately spring to mind in the job, of, job description of a leader. But it's, it's abundantly clear to me from the flow of what Jesus has to say that it is these who he sees as having the potential to be an influence for good. My reading of the Bible tells me that we should not be expecting to find our leaders in where we might consider the job description roles to be, but in the most unusual of places, including cheeky, lazy boys from very urban backgrounds. Remember the choosing of David as the successor to Saul as the king of Israel, recorded for us in 1 Samuel 16. Samuel is sent on a mission to meet Jesse in a little town of little consequence, Bethlehem. Jesse then seeks to parade a succession of his sons in front of Samuel, who is advised by the Lord not to consider their appearance or their height, which would ordinarily be hallmarks of potential leadership. And after seeing seven of Jesse's sons and having been told by God that none of them were to be chosen, Jesse eventually identifies his youngest son, the sheep farmer, a bit red-faced from being outside, but otherwise a pretty young man with nice eyes, says the Bible. Imagine the commotion there must have been when Samuel took the anointing oil and poured it over David in the presence of his father and his brothers. It's noticeable, too, that we're not called to be salt and light in the church, but salt and light in the earth. Whatever it means to be salt and light is clearly something that needs to take place beyond the relative safety of our church environments. However, there is a clear requirement resting with our churches to prepare their congregations to be influential within our wider society as salt and light. Two essential elements of church leadership in this respect are to cast vision and to release people into ministry. If we are not assisting people of faith to be salt and light in our wider world, then we are failing in what I would argue is the most important reason for our existence in this period of grace, which is mission. I'm sure we've heard many a sermon on these two very well-known metaphors and there's always a danger in allowing mental gymnastics to take these metaphors to extremes. However, why did Jesus use salt and light as ways to demonstrate how we are to influence the wider world? And what lessons are there for Christians in positions of leadership outside the church? The first and most important uh, connotation from the use of salt is that of value. Jesus was saying these words at a time when people understood that salt itself had intrinsic value. In Roman times, salt would have been used for commerce and trade. Roman soldiers would have been at least partly paid in salt. Salt was a scarce and expensive commodity. And it was from these times that we get the phrase to be worth one salt. And it's also the origin of the word salary. So what I think Jesus was saying here is that as people of faith, we are of immense value in the world. People may not immediately appreciate this value due to the world's different standards in assessing value. In fact, the very thing that makes us valuable, our faith in Jesus Christ, is the very thing that the world seeks to marginalise. And Christian leaders in the wider world need to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves in seeking ways to demonstrate the value of the gospel through the way they operate. Deal with people and meet the goals of their organisations, companies or networks within which they have been placed in positions of responsibility. And it goes back to the way in which God calls people into leadership. As Paul writes in the first letter to the Corinthians, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. I certainly wasn't. Not many were influential, not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, 
And God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Part of the component value of salt is its preservative qualities. It was and is used to stop decay. As Christians, we should be working to uphold truth, justice, mercy, compassion, and tolerance, all factors which in wider society seem to be in a state of decay. Christian leaders have a role to play in preserving these important qualities within our society. Salt, too, enhances flavour. As Christian leaders in our wider society, what are we doing to bring the amazing flavours of the kingdom of God to the people around us? Are we guilty of toning down our ability to spread kingdom flavour? To be flavoursome, salt needs to be sprinkled, not dumped. Going back to the comments from Tim Farron, there is a risk that we can become too heavenly minded to be of no earthly use. We need to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Before I fall into my own trap of mental gymnastics, let's turn to light. The great thing about light is that it is the perfect antidote to darkness. And one of my favorite Bible verses is Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. And this is captured for me in a picture by Joseph Farquharson, which the FCN board presented me with when I stood down as chairman of FCN. And this is called The Sun Peeps O'er Yon Southern Hills. The sun just appearing over the hillside after a night The sheep have been out on the hillside, in the snow, in the dark. Our fears and worries, our concerns always appear worse in the night. But with the dawning of the day comes new hope. Light is always stronger than darkness. Darkness can't overcome light. We can seek to constrict the extent to which the light has influenced, but where it is present, there is no darkness. Wherever light is on the scene, darkness has to give way. So what message does this leave us if Jesus refers to us as the light of the world? We have the ability to be light bearers for our society in its darkened, most darkened corners. As Christians, we ought to be fully involved in bringing light to every situation over which we have influence. What is God's heart for some of the big rural issues, such as isolation, inequality, poor service provision, future agricultural policy, affordable housing, planning, and so much more. Is there a particularly Christian perspective on land taxation, food security, access to land, and environmental policy? If so, what are we doing to project God's heart and to equip our leaders to have the confidence to be the conduit through which this occurs? It's often said of individuals that they lighten up the room when they appear. And as Christians in wider society, that should be our calling card. Better than being dubbed with Anne Whittacombe's description of Michael Howard when she said he had something of the night about him. So what gives us that light? It's the word of God within us. And we know from John chapter 1 that the word is Jesus. And I've been thinking a lot recently about Psalm 119 and verse 105, which says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light on my path. Why do we need both a lamp and a light? What I take from this is that the light to our path is the revealed word of God to us, provided for us through scripture, and revealed to us through the gospel of Christ. This gives us, if you like, a map to allow us to chart our way through life, showing us the correct paths to take, the dead ends, the dark corners to avoid, and allowing us to stay on the straight and narrow. However, that does not prevent us from encountering obstacles on the path along the way. And we need to be holding on to the word of God as a personal daily lamp and guide to ensure that step by step we are able to deal with whatever comes our way. And in our positions of leadership, we need to have the courage, confidence and conviction to be that light to wider society, providing God's perspective on the right and wrong way to do things at a strategic level, 
and applying valuable biblical principles at a practical grassroots level. However, we've got to be prepared for rejection. From John 1 and verse 5, we read, to bear, we need to bear in mind that when the light shines in the darkness, whilst the darkness is unable to overcome it, it also doesn't understand it. And as people of faith in positions of leadership in society, we have got to be prepared for being misunderstood. So why then do I talk about our feet of clay? And going back to what I said earlier, it's to remind us that we were chosen as imperfect people and used by God as imperfect people. Nicky Gumbel from Holy Trinity Brompton in his Bible in a Year series records for us a story about the great Christian leader John Stott, who was speaking on one occasion at a university mission in Sydney. On the last night of the mission, as a result of an infection, he had virtually lost his voice. (coughs) Nevertheless, he was persuaded, persuaded to speak, and waiting in the side room beforehand, he read Paul's account of the thorn in the flesh. And he would dearly have loved for God to have restored his voice to full health and strength, but it wasn't to be. But he was assured that God's grace was enough for him, and God's power would be made perfect in weakness. And when the time came for him to speak, he croaked his way through his sermon, through that microphone. But he went back to Australia many times after that, and on every occasion was approached by someone who had been there that night and had made a personal commitment to Christ, despite his difficulties in delivering the message. We may be very aware of our own weaknesses, but we should be encouraged that when we are weak, we are not on our own. God turns our weaknesses into strength. Hebrews 11 records for us a catalogue of people who are remembered for putting faith into action. Many of those appearing within that list have also displayed great weakness. Noah was found naked and drunk by his children. Abraham tried to rationalise his position by seeking to hasten the promises of God through an inappropriate relationship with Hagar. Jacob deceived his father and stole stole his brother's birthright. Moses was at least guilty of manslaughter, if not murder. And when the time came for him to step up to the plate, he made every excuse in the book for not doing what God wanted him to do. Gideon didn't believe that he could fulfill God's plan. Samson, in many ways, led a reckless life and yet himself let himself be duped into having his strength stripped from him. David committed adultery and had a man killed as a result. Rahab was a prostitute. Jephthah made a senseless, immoral an ungodly sacrifice of his daughter. Of course, we should all be striving for better, to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness in one of those beatitudes that we read earlier, and understand that as Christians, sin is no longer our friend. But we are reminded if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. My wife Sharon and I have a phrase that we sometimes use, particularly in the context of diets, When perhaps we stray from the path of abstinence and we say, well, we might as well be hung for a sheep as a lamb. In other words, if we've fallen by the wayside by consuming one chocolate biscuit, we might as well finish the packet and start again tomorrow. Not sensible in that context, not sensible in any context. The proper handling of such situations is given to us in 1 John chapters 1 and 2, where we're told to confess our sins through our advocate, Jesus, and the Father will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The lesson here is that none of us can claim perfection. All of us are vulnerable to failure. And when our leaders fail, it almost seems as if the fall is more spectacular for the fact that they were more public and under the spotlight. I'm not in any way trying to undermine the need for good conduct in all walks of life. However, we need to recognise that we all have feet of clay and we must work hard to support, encourage, restore and rebuild each other and to pray for our Christian leaders so that they avoid the traps of the enemy into which they could so easily fall. So then, what lessons are there for the church to help Christians in positions of leadership outside the church fulfil their functions of being salt and light, albeit with feet of clay? The first and most important work of the church is to hold on to the word and to guard the truth. 
As we have seen, the word of God is both a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. And I am troubled when I read or listen to commentary from church sources which seeks to reinterpret scripture through the changing fashions of society. To me, this is entirely the wrong way around. Instead, we need to be interpreting what we see changing around us through the constancy of scripture. In Revelation 1 verse 8, we read God declaring that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and was and is to come. This is the measuring line that we need to be using. The inspired word of God stands firm. In attempting to live our faith as Christian leaders in wider society, it does us no favours at all when the church seeks to align itself with error rather than with truth. By way of illustration, I turn to the lyrics of a spoken word piece performed by that old Christian rocker, Larry Norman. It's called The Tune. I won't do it justice. Um, You can go and search it for yourself on Spotify. It goes like this. Once there was a tune, and everybody knew how it went. But as time went by, people began to forget. Until at last, no one could remember, and there was hatred and wars, and death. Then one day someone said, how does the tune go? There is no tune. There never was. It's only a myth. These were the philosophers. You mean there's no tune at all? Well, it doesn't really matter what tune you play, as long as you play something. These were the religious leaders. And so the world played on, and there was hatred and wars and death. Then one day the people became weary of this song, and they all sat down on the side of a hill, and suddenly they heard a strange voice. And someone said, that sounds like the tune. There is no tune. There never was. There never will be. Well, it doesn't really matter what tune you play, as long as you play something, and you don't hurt anybody, especially me. But the people listened. And a man appeared before them with a smile on his face and a sad look, too. And he was singing the tune. And some of the people began to sing along, and the people who loved him decided to follow him, but the people who hated him decided to kill him. And they did. And when it was finished, they went back to the houses of philosophy and religion and sat down at their tables to eat and drink, and suddenly they were interrupted by a familiar voice. And they ran to their windows and looked outside to see who it was. It was him. And they became confused and afraid. And they wondered how they could be rid of him once and for all. And while they were watching him, something very strange happened. How did he do that? I don't really know. But he's gone. And when trouble goes, you don't ask where. He'll never return again. I hope. Yet again they were interrupted. This time they ran out into the streets to lay hold of him. But they couldn't find him. Just a lot of people smiling. And they all knew the tune. And when the people made a mistake, they stopped and they listened. And that's how they knew the tune, because they listened. And if you listen, you'll hear it. It's all around you. Just listen to your radio, watch television, listen to your leaders, to the authorities, to the governments, to the experts. But if you really listen, you can hear another tune. But you have to listen quietly. And you have to listen every day. So as we seek to preserve the tune, let's not be eager to please. Remember we're told in 1 Corinthians 1, 23-24 that the gospel, whilst being the power of God and the salvation, is a stumbling block to the Gentiles. We've got to expect for the light not to be understood. Remember the encounter of Jesus with the rich young ruler who asked what he needed to do to gain eternal life. The specific word for him from Jesus was to go, sell everything, and give to the poor. I repeat, a specific word for him. I'm not at all saying that that's what we should be doing in this room today. It was a specific word for that young ruler. And we read in Mark 10 that he walked away rather than respond positively to what he was being told to do. And we don't read that Jesus ran after him to say, Hang on a minute, how about just sell half of everything? And as he disappears into the distance, 10%! At this point, can I say there's a massive difference between holding on to the truth 
and being condemnatory. We are utterly not to condemn. The miracle which we refer to as the feeding of the 5,000, which is the only miracle recorded for us in all four Gospels, each account gives us additional facts to enrich our knowledge. But for me, what's important is that Jesus didn't discriminate. He fed everybody. He didn't ask about their background, their sins, their good works, whether they were in inappropriate relationships, whether they were there for him or against him. He fed everyone without partiality. He didn't take the opportunity of reminding them of his teaching, just given previously as part of the Sermon on the Mount, with the various categories of people listed in the Beatitudes to be fed and send everybody else home hungry. We don't hear him say, right, the peacemakers, come forward, you can be fed first. Those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, you can come forward and go through the whole list and then send everybody else home. Everyone was fed without exception. And there was even enough for others to be fed too. I often wonder what happened to the 12 baskets and where they went. The encounter with the woman found in adultery is again a lesson of displaying the truth in love in wider society. Having challenged the stone carriers to investigate their own hearts, And seeing them slip away, he asks the woman, who was left to condemn her? It could be argued that the one individual remaining, Jesus, was the only one in a position to condemn her. But his words were beautiful. Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. The truth displayed in love. The truth was not disguised in love. The truth was not displaced in love. The truth was not destroyed in love. The truth was displayed in love. And the church needs to hold firmly to the truth and teach its people how to display it in love. To provide leaders of faith in secular society with the language, tools and ability to act accordingly without shifting the ground from beneath their feet. In Romans 12, we are called not to conform to the pattern of the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are called to be countercultural, And this is obviously going to lead to situations where we will knock our shoulders and bump into people rushing headlong in the opposite direction. To us, some of them oblivious to who we are, and some of them in outright opposition. Therefore, we need to teach our leaders in secular society how to rely on the whole armour of God. As churches, we should also take time to map our congregations and parishioners to get a sense of the context of the leadership contained within those groups. Which parts of rural life do they touch? And which perhaps the church itself is not touching directly? Develop a regular commitment to pray for individuals Be they on planning committees, leading a farmer discussion group, a land agent, working for a third sector organisation, or even in banking. Check in regularly with those individuals both to encourage, support and guide, but also to hear from them what is happening in the wider community within which the church is operating. These individuals will have much richness to bring to informing the church about reaching people with the good news. And so the church should be a safe place for leaders in secular society. The workman's hut within which we can all gain sustenance, enjoy fellowship, share experiences, and get ready for the job at hand. And a great example of this is the consistency of Theresa May, agree with her politics or not, in attending church Sunday by Sunday, regardless of what is on her plate, day today. Busy leaders in wider society need the protection, love and support of our churches. Often, rather than being places for these activities, they can be hunting grounds for church leaders in finding people who may fill positions of responsibility within the church. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with encouraging people to serve, but we need to protect those who are busy serving already. Finally, I want to sound a warning about what I consider to be a worrying false doctrine that is beginning to emerge and have created in some Christian circles. It's a belief that Christians 
have a mandate to build a kingdom of heaven on earth by supernaturally transforming ourselves and our institutions by whatever means possible. Yes, we are to be salt and light. Yes, we are to be purveyors of the gospel. And yes, we are to display Jesus to the world. But we are not about establishing a kingdom on earth. Jesus was pressed at the point of his ascension over whether it was going to be the time for his kingdom to be established. And Jesus responds by telling them, it's not for them to know the times or date that God has set by his own authority. And so, the Bible teaches us to take responsibility under God's authority, not to usurp his control and timing. That, my friends, is biblical leadership. Thank you.